Stand by America. It's time for real television as MMM Carpets brings you movies till the sun comes up thing. Here's your host, Gary! Welcome to Movies Till Dawn, a new podcast that's a safe space for filmmakers to talk about the fascinating and exasperating, always unusual and never quite the same thing twice process of creating motion pictures. I'm Raymond DeFelita, and I hope you're coming back because you loved what you're hearing. So today I'm going to share with you a conversation that I had with the late John G. Abelson uh, a few years ago now. Uh, John was a marvelous director, and well... If you're listening to this podcast, you probably know who John G. Abelson is. You certainly know two of the most iconic movies of the 1970s and 80s, which he directed, Rocky and The Karate Kid. They both spawned so many sequels that, you know, you can't, you get into the double digits when you count those sequels. Um, and, and John also directed a lot of other movies, uh, terrific ones like Joe with Peter Boyle, Save the Tiger with Jack Lemmon. Um, he, he made a fascinating movie. I've always really liked it. It wasn't a success in his day called The Formula with Marlon Brando and George C. Scott. Uh, John had a wide-ranging career. Lean on Me with Morgan Freeman was another excellent film of his. Uh, he, he worked a lot. And one of the things I always admired about John is he came from a, a tradition where uh, it wasn't about being perfect. It was about working. It was about making another picture. It was, he was a hard-nosed, tough guy movie director, kind of from the studio years, except he wasn't from the studio years. In fact, one of the things about John that I always found interesting, and he talks about this in our conversation, is he came up through an indie film world that didn't really yet exist. He was a New Yorker who, in the 1960s, he thought he wanted to be a, an advertising guy, but he fell in love with filmmaking, and he worked uh, on New York movies in the 60s that you've never heard of. And then he decided, I'll, I can just do all of it. I'll be the director and the and the cameraman and the editor. And that's how he sold himself. And he started doing super low budget nudies, as they were called. Uh, and he worked his way into winning an Oscar for Rocky. Here's how I met John. Uh, I made a movie called City Island. And when it came out, uh, I, I, got a, I got some nice emails from people who I didn't know because they liked the movie. The, the strangest one in my inbox was from John Abelson. He said, don't know if you know my work, but I just wanted to tell you I really liked your movie. If you ever want to have a coffee, call me. I wrote him back, and I said, yeah, I think I've heard of you, and I think I know a little bit about your work. Yeah. Well, he got it. He was like, okay. You know, so, so, so we met. We had a, uh, we had a glass of wine at, um, at the Polo Lounge, which is very appropriate in a sense if you kind of look at the era from which John kind of hit it big in Hollywood. Uh, and we, we started a ritual. We would go up to his house in Coldwater Canyon, we'd have dinner, and we'd watch one of his movies. It was funny because it wasn't John gloating over his work. He had a very detached sense of what it was, and he was very happy to tell you what was wrong with the movie, or what went wrong with this, or what he didn't get. Or you know, uh, it, it was fun for him, I think, to kind of do it in that objective, standoffish way. Like I said, he made a lot of movies. And he didn't speak highly of too many of them. But he, what he liked was the process. He liked to talk about how they did things or why this should have been better or why this particular thing worked. And you'll hear quite a bit about this in, in this conversation. Um, in addition to the movies that he made that are really famous that you know, one of the other things about John that's interesting is he got fired or quit from some of the most famous movies you know. Uh, and we talk about that. If he thought something had to be a certain way, he could not be convinced otherwise. And he didn't even hold that up as a mark of pride. He would just say to you, I, what can I do? Didn't agree with him. Left. Wasn't going to do it. He almost, I think, found himself sort of amused at his own kind of arrogance in these issues. He, he didn't walk around with a gloomy sense of what else could he have done. He, he was very much who he was. He was a singular guy. Um, and uh, I, I had a great time knowing him. So here's part one of my conversation with John Avildsen. Uh, 
I met this guy in the advertising business, Jack O'Connell, and I wanted to have my own ad agency by the time I was 30. That was my, my dream. And I met him at this agency where I was a uh, copywriter, and his dream was to make movies. And he went on and on about how the movie director is the prince of the 20th century. This guy really believed this stuff. And uh, I got drafted in 59, and he went off to Italy and worked for Antonioni and Fellini. And when he came back, I got out of the army in 61, and I worked for him, and I said, forget advertising. This is a lot more fun. Yeah, yeah. And it is. When you began, New York filmmaking was a, a it was a limited field in the '60s. There was Sidney Lumet and that crowd, and Arthur Penn to a certain extent. Woody Allen hadn't yet started. But when you started, you were essentially a New Yorker who turned himself into kind of a one man band. You directed. You were your own cinematographer. You were your own editor. Was that a plan to get started in in the business? No, I figured for the same eight bucks you get uh, you get three guys. Right. <laughs> And I, uh, I like shooting because I figure, you know, what better place to be? And that was before Video Village. And if you wanted to see what was going on on the camera, then you had to be behind it. And if you're behind it and you say, I'm ready, why isn't everybody else ready? Yeah. Uh, things go quicker. And, and nobody's going to stay up as late at night fixing all my blunders when it comes to editing the thing than I. So who better than, than me to edit it? And uh, that, that's why I always figured that it made sense to do all those three jobs. I, I made a lot of uh, industrial films doing all those three jobs, and um, that was a great uh, learning experience. They would let you do anything you wanted. You could use any music you wanted because, you know, salesmen were going to see this thing and get all excited about the, the new Shell gasoline or the new IBM hula or whatever. So, um, you know, you'd go off and shoot these things and put whatever music you wanted uh, behind it. And uh, it was great. I had great fun doing that thing. And then one day I saw on backstage it said wanted movie director. And the guy who put the ad in the paper had never made a movie before, so he didn't know that's not how you do it. <laughs> What was what, what did the movie? Oh, it was turn a horrible movie. It was called uh, "Turn On to Love." You have some great titles early in your filmography that are very. Yeah, I "Turn On to Love." The other one I like is um, "Guess What We Learned in School Today." Guess what? What? Guess what the producer and director of Joe have come up with now? Real. First time, mommy slaps his hands when he tries to play with his pee pee. I get so excited. That broad is a charter member of the Liberal Party. I just like it. Are you still a virgin, Robbie? Everybody was going up to uh, Woodstock, and uh, I had a family and rent, and I and I, and I figured I, I you know I got to come up with something to pay for all this, so I f figured I'd uh, make the uh, ultimate exploitation film, and it would be called Love Thy Neighbor, and I had a, a friend who had a house up in the, the suburbs, and these two. Uh, uh, neighbors would uh, sexually do everything you could imagine to one another. And it would, because uh, they, he had a house and the neighbor, I figured, it would be, you know, you could do it for not a lot of money. Then I came across a thing called SECUS, the Sex Information and Education Council of the U.S. It was a very highbrow uh, organization espousing sex education in schools. I said, hmm. What if they uh, came to this uptight uh, community in Westchester and there was all this outrage about uh, sex education in the schools? So I thought that would be a lot more fun. So that's where that came from. Right. And were these movies, uh, were they soft? How would you describe them? Soft, soft core or? Well, uh, Turn On to, uh, to Love was, uh, guess what, was body. It wasn't, it didn't make any right. Uh, attempt to stimulate <laughs> it was strictly um, broad comedy right no pun intended so what was the audience for these were these 42nd street house movies well or uh, the first movies? the first one was uh and then uh guess what was made by canon they had made uh, skin flicks or they bought swedish skin and put in some new scenes and so forth i came up with this uh, guess what I did, and they, uh, they went for that. And when I was uh, editing that, 
they came in and said, look, we've raised some money uh, to make this uh, other script, and we realized it was really a bad idea, uh, but we don't want to give the money back, so we got to make something right away. Can you make something? I said, well, remember that, that treatment I showed you that Norman uh, Wexler wrote? Yeah, well, that would make a great movie. And, uh, all right. So with great reluctance, uh, we had to write the script, and uh, with... Uh, Within four weeks of them saying, okay, we wrote the script and cast it, and the beginning of January 1970, we started shooting uh, Joe. The Cannon Releasing Corporation would like you to meet Joe. Motorcycles, marijuana, not really fags, but close. What he likes is to have a little on the side once in a while. I'll drink to that. For all my life, I ain't never been to an orgy. Uh, I hope I'm not out of line. 100 milligrams of Thorazine in the butt does wonders. Get your pants on. You and I watched Joe a couple of years ago, and it 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 felt then, and it feels probably even more now, weirdly timely, because Joe's overt and proud uh, racism, his uh, his stance at everything, has now become, I think, once again, a way that people can proudly say, "I'm being." politically incorrect, which is not a term that existed then. And I think at the time it must have seemed shocking because in 1970, I don't know that many movies were, were talking that way or, or behaving that way. Well, uh, when uh, Trump showed up a year and a half ago, I said, Joe lives. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I was thinking about. Um, it. Yeah. But back in those days, the things that inspired Norman Wexler to write that script, and he had never written a script before, and he got nominated for that which I don't know if that's happened with anybody else whose first script got nominated. But he was, in, uh, he was influenced by the silent majority and a Gail Sheehy story in New York Magazine about a, uh, a, a rich uh, Greenwich, Connecticut girl who comes to the, uh, the village and ends up with a, uh, a dope dealer. So those two things came together, uh, and that's what inspired that Joe story. So Joe was clearly a, a big cut above aesthetically and, and you know and intellectually the previous few movies you had made. Was that a leap? Well, I had a real good script. But you were looking to make that leap, obviously. You, well, I, I wasn't. I, I you know I was busy cutting. Guess what? And they came in and said, "You got to make something." <laughs> I had showed them in hopes that they would respond. They didn't, and I didn't show it to anybody else because I was busy cutting the uh, guess what. But, you know, that's why I believe in chaos. It, it feels like you accidentally have gone through so many great things that have led one thing to another, whether it's falling from advertising into industrial films or even no. beginning with, with, with the films that you did. Because you were the one-man band, you could answer an I, ad in the backstage I, that said director I, for say for, I for don't hire. believe in fate. Uh, I don't uh, believe in any of that stuff. Maybe it's more comfortable if you do, but... I think we're out here in the middle of nowhere and things happen. Yeah. What happened next? Save the Tiger? No. Um, uh, no, the Burt Reynolds movie. Uh, WW and the Dixie Dance Kings. Right. That was, uh, Tom Rickman wrote a really terrific script, um, uh, but I had no interest in Burt Reynolds. Uh, I, I wanted Jimmy Conn to, uh, to play the part. The people who were paying for it, they didn't want to hear that. So I passed. And... Um, and time went on, and I got divorced, and the bills started uh, piling up, and suddenly Burt Reynolds looked terrific. <laughs> and um, I went off and uh, did that. And was that, was that a wildly happy experience? Uh, he was a pain in the neck. But, you know, it finally got over. Yeah, because he was the star. Oh, 27 hours out of every day. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's hard to remember now what a major, major star he was in oh, the yeah. 70s. And that started all those uh, hoo-ha and the bandit, Smokey and the Bandit. Was, that... it, a, was it a period piece? Uh, uh, no, but it, this is the lovable crook who speeds around in a car. Right. That was a studio movie. That was Fox, right. Yeah. So you jumped suddenly from Joe again on location in New York and doing all of your own work to this big fat studio movie with a movie star i'm sure you weren't your own dp and i'm sure you weren't your own editor at that no point. And, and save the tiger was before that yeah so uh lemon was the first big star i had and he was the polar opposite of burt reynolds right. he was he was i always said lemon was a peach <laughs> he was so 
uh, and when I came out here, uh, I was living in New York, and I came out here to audition for him, and I loved Steve Shagan's script. And it was really a, a, a terrific script. Depressing, but really good. And I said to Lemon, I said, you know, I've always liked your movies, but if you pick me to do this, I don't want to see you in it. I want to see this guy. He said, that's right, kid. You keep your eyes open. <laughs> <laughs> so he, oh, I was so lucky. At, at the end of a take, if I wasn't smiling, he'd say, you want me to do it without the eyebrow? <laughs> <laughs> And, or if he'd make a suggestion and I didn't light up, he'd say, hey, you want to do that, you go ahead. Me, I think that idea stinks. <laughs> so I was very fortunate. How's it regulating? I sent Dusty to cover my appointments. I just wanted to tell you, Harry. I'm sorry. Everybody misses. Not professionals. Oh, yeah, professionals, too. Quarterbacks get knocked down, nurses get knocked up, somebody invented the edge, so everybody misses. Save the Tiger was also, though, a somewhat offbeat, not a big, oh. not a big movie. A... He took, he did it for um, for scale, right? And and Steve Shagan uh, convinced him. He said, "Jack, they're not laughing anymore." So um, when uh, Lemon got on board, um, it made it happen, and he saw Joe, and that's what got me the job. So was Save the Tiger a studio movie? Yep, that was uh, Paramount. Isn't that something? These are just imagine and Paramount Robert, making Save the Tiger. And now. Robert <laughs> Evans was our hero there. Yeah, he said, "Stay off the lot," <laughs> and you could, you know, because it was a very low budget. It was a million bucks, also. Yeah. And uh, so he uh, he was a, a champion of the of the story. It was all shot around L.A. Mm hmm. Did you shoot it? Uh, no, I couldn't because I, I, this was my first union picture. Oh, of course, yeah. And we went to the IA with, with uh, Steve Shagan, and uh, I said, you know, I always am my own operator and everything. You know, I was talking to myself. Uh, but that's where I met uh, uh, Jimmy Crabe, who had shot a movie for Steve. And Jimmy Crabe uh, was heaven. Uh, we became very good friends, and I don't know how many movies we shot together. And he came from a low-budget world, and... Uh, if I wanted to operate the camera, it wasn't the end of the world. and So I had a great time uh, with uh, uh, James Crabe. What did Lemon winning the Oscar for Save the Tiger? I mean, obviously, I know what it did for you. It made you a, an A-list director. Did you expect that? Uh, no. Um, I had... Because um, it's about six or seven years from Turn On to Love to, to your lead actor winning an Oscar for right. Save the Tiger. And I almost did uh, Serpico. But I wouldn't give the producer's girlfriend a job, so I got fired. So, so you could say that Sidney Lumet owes the the film that essentially changed his his you know began the second half of his career to you having a fight with the producer about the producer's girlfriend. Oh well, yes, you definitely could, uh, <laughs> Sidney Lumet. Yes, definitely. Yes, I know. There's been a couple of big projects that you almost directed. Another one is. Saturday Night Fever. Right. Have you regretted ever the... You bet. <laughs> no, I, I kind of knew the answer to that question, I, but I thought I'd give it to you. No, to, uh, I, and again, it was uh, two weeks before we uh, started a shoot that I got canned. Well, it, it turned out, one, I, dare, I wanted a different ending, and two, I was going out with the producer's boyfriend's <laughs> girlfriend, and that thickened the plot. It's a, a very disco-era reason to be fired from a movie. Right. Yeah, that's a <laughs> <laughs> right, and her job uh, was to take me around to all the discos yeah. because I wasn't familiar with that world, and which was great because we didn't have to stand in any lines and, right. you know, and <laughs> got treated like royalty. That's another great thing about movies. You get treated like royalty when you go location. You, and, I, and I remember uh, when I was working as a production manager and so on in the 60s of going to like New Orleans and knocking on doors, we'd like to shoot a movie. Oh, come on in and sit down. Can we get, you know, and there was never any talk of money. It was just that the movies and the magic and they're going to shoot a movie. Oh, I can tell our neighbors. Those days are gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we shot a scene in my movie, Rob the Mob. We shot a full five days. In fact, it was all the scenes with Andy Garcia 
in a, a beautiful house in Long Island. Oh, and, I remember that, looking over the yeah, sound. Yeah, and, right. and, and the owners were the sweetest people, and I think that, you know, the, I think his wife was very eager to meet Andy. And they said, absolutely, and, and your script sounds great, and we'd love you to do it. And I'll never forget the look on her face the first day we loaded in. <laughs> it was the end of her world. She was right. she was so shocked and no, no, so that, dismayed that, 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 at what we what we and we didn't even mistreat her house. It's just suddenly there were a hundred people right. with cables everywhere. Yeah, it's a it's a terrible. No, experience. it's on the first page. <laughs> Do not let the movie company in your house. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, let me let me ask you frankly. So you, you missed the opportunity to do two very famous movies in the 70s. And of course you say you regret it, but would they have been very different if you had done them? Or I guess, have you even ever seen them? Have you bothered to watch Serpico or Saturday Night Fever? Oh, I watched them uh, uh, both. Um, Were they what you what you would have made of the material, do you think? Um, well, the reason I got fired from Serpico, I wouldn't give the producer's girlfriend a job. Right. And the irony is, the girl I wanted... Uh, who uh, was uh, at an open call, and she came in, and I uh, I wanted her to play the part. She, in reality, was Frank's girlfriend at the time. Frank Serpico's. Yeah. Right, and when she came in, she never told me. And I only learned about it years and years later, and, and Frank never knew about it. So that, uh, that would have been a big uh, uh, difference. I would have uh, followed the book uh, more uh, closely. And in... Uh, Saturday Night Fever, uh, I got uh, Norman the, uh, the the job on that to write it, and which was Norman, Norman Wexler. Norman who wrote Wexler, Joe, yeah. And and he wrote a very sort of lukewarm ending, where the Travolta character comes and sits in the bay window with the girl who's thinking of going to New York, and she's going to be a secretary, and and they sort of agree to be friends. And I thought, what a snore. And the way I wanted to end it was that they were uh, uh, competing, and this was in the story, they were uh, competing in a dance contest. Then they have a falling out. So uh, I was going to have them come together at the end to still compete and have the Travolta character switch the song that they had been rehearsing uh, to over and over again, that we've seen them rehearsing to. And he slips in. Uh, a song that they've never danced to. <laughs> so, so now there, there's suddenly this new music shows up, and she's really pissed, right. right? But because they're great dancers and because they love each other, they win. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great fun for the audience to see them dancing terrific, as as though it were spontaneous. And they didn't get they didn't it. Didn't go for it. No. His name is Sylvester Stallone. He's the star of a new film called Rocky. He's been described as tough, handsome, talented, sexy, sensitive, dynamic, brilliant. He's been compared to Nicholson, De Niro, and Brando, but he is Rocky. He's the man who could be loved by only one woman because somehow she gets beneath the pain. He's every nobody who ever needed somebody. Rocky, do you believe that America is the land of opportunity? Yeah. With Rocky, you have a movie with an unknown shot in a, a fairly quick schedule, if I'm... 28 days. In, in spite of the, the circumstances of where it was distributed or where you posted, that's nothing that a studio would do now, certainly, oh, and not goodness. even 20 years ago, probably. Well, some of the uniqueness was that um, the uh, producers, Chordoff and Winkler, were um, uh, highly thought of by Arthur Krim and United Artists. And they had uh, some kind of a, a deal with United Artists that they could make what they wanted to as long as it uh, was below a certain budget and blah, blah, blah. So um, this uh, qualified and was uh, made for a million bucks or less. And, um, and they had to um, put up the, their houses in case the thing went over. Right. And um, they said, okay, and <laughs> great story. Um, uh, Sylvester had come in and auditioned for me for the first time in 
1970, 71, when I was making a Jackie Mason movie down in, in Miami Beach, and he was a student at the Miami University down there. And then he came in, auditioned again when I was making a uh, Burt Reynolds movie. He came in as a hillbilly. He didn't get either job. Then I saw Lords of Flatbush, and he was terrific in that. So um, when uh, my friend told me about uh, this thing, I said, oh, you know, uh, I'm not interested in, in boxing, but he persisted, and I loved the script, and I had no trouble with um, Sylvester. But they had never they had never heard of uh, Sylvester Stallone, so the uh, producers showed him uh, Lords of Flatbush. So they said, "Oh, okay." So now they're looking at the first day's uh, rushes, and they said, well, "Where's Stallone?" He said, "Well, that guy's Stallone." He said, "No, no, Stallone's a blonde." They thought uh, Perry. They thought he was uh, uh, Stallone. Oh, so he got a complete accident. Right. 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 So, so walk me through the order of events that got Rocky made. When were you? Where did his script go to first? When did you come on? When did the... well, an old friend of mine, Gene Kirkwood, uh, I'd gotten him a job there uh, at uh, the Charnock Winkler, and he brought uh, Sylvester in there one day as an actor, and they yakka yakka for acting. And then, as uh, Sylvester was leaving, he said, "Oh, I also uh, write scripts. Would you like to read one?" I said, oh, okay. Yeah, boy, that's what we really want to do, yeah. is read another script. <laughs> well, you, so, char- you charge for that now, I understand. Yes, exactly. Uh, so um, um, he uh, came by and left a script, and they read the script, and they liked it. He said, we like this. We'd like to uh, buy this. But he had already sold that script. He said, but I'll write you another one. And in uh, three or four days later, he uh, brought in uh, the script. And I always thought that I got the job because I had uh, fixed one of their, well, I couldn't fix it, but I shot one of their reshot and, you know, came in on budget and I'd done the Joe and was known for low budget and blah, blah, blah. Um, but that wasn't why I got it. Uh, John Borman, who was a, uh, friends with Robert Chartoff, one of the producers, and Chartoff recently checked out of the Grand Hotel and there's a memorial and John Borman uh, spoke there. And uh, one of the things he said was that they brought him the Rocky script. And uh, he passed, and he also urged them not to make it. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I always thought that I was the first choice. So They couldn't get who they wanted, so they got you. They, uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter at the end of the day. Well, I think he true. did The Exorcist 2 instead. So. I'm sorry? I think he did The Exorcist 2 instead of that. Well, that could be, but he did uh, Deliverance, and boy, that was a movie I wanted to do. I was up for that. Oh, what a terrific uh, uh, story that was. Again, what's so interesting about that is the movies that that almost got made that would have been completely different had you done Deliverance. No, Borman did a great job, and the movie was really very well done. But Rocky wouldn't have been Rocky had he done it. Well, and um, the uh, the script that I first got wasn't like the final movie, uh, and um, um, Sylvester was interf- interviewed not long ago, and I heard for the first time that he imagined it being like Mean Streets, Rocky being a very depressed, angry, bitter guy. You know, it certainly didn't turn out that way. What influence was that? Was that your turning it around, or Mister Optimism? <laughs> <laughs> I remember hearing that you shot the all of the training scenes in Philly in, in secret. Not so much the the training stuff. Uh, I shot that on an eight millimeter. We shot all his running around. They they said you can't go to Philadelphia. You haven't got the, you know we haven't got that kind of money. I said well, I made a lot of movies with these guys in New York. Got a great non-union crew, and my own cameraman. We can sneak in there and shoot all the exteriors, and uh, then go to LA for the interiors. And they fortunately said okay, and um, we shot um, more than a third of the movie there before we got caught. Right. Well, you did. I mean, you've done your share of boxing scenes, of, of, of karate, of you know how much how much goes into into making sure that, I mean, I know that there's plenty of stunt double in that, but there's no, got to well, be... No, well, I've never used stunt doubles for it, but I'm a big believer in rehearsal. 
and all that uh, stuff starting with uh, Rocky. I had uh, never really seen a boxing movie and I looked at them and I thought that boxing looked really phony. And, and I said to the producers, the only way we're going to get this thing to look real is if they get a chance to rehearse a lot. So uh, I convinced them to give us a couple of weeks so that, uh, before we started to shoot and also to put the, uh, the, the, the fight at the end of the movie, uh, the schedule, so we would have the most time to prepare for it. So that actually was the continuity, the shooting continuity you finished with the last fight. Right. But two weeks before we began to shoot, I got the two guys in the ring and they started bouncing around saying, I'll do this and I'll do that. And I said, wait a second, we're going to be here forever. Sylvester, why don't you go home, write this thing out, lefts, rights, you fall down, he fall, whatever you want, write it out. And then we'll learn that like a ballet and we'll do it over and over and over again. And by the time we come to shoot it, maybe it will look good. <laughs> and it worked because by the time we did come to shoot it, it did look good. And I shot a lot of eight millimeter movie of, of the rehearsal and I would play it for them. And, you know, I said, they're going to be looking at you, not me. And this sure could look a lot better. And if you lost a couple of pounds, it couldn't hurt. Uh, and then I showed it to uh, uh, Bill Cotty and uh, played some uh, Beethoven Sixth Symphony behind it and slowed up the projector. And it, and it made it magical. And that, and, and, you know, you play Beethoven uh, uh, behind leader and the leader looks good. Uh, and, it, and it just made the, 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 the boxing that much more important by having, and uh, Bill liked the idea. He'd gone to uh, Juilliard and, and appreciated classical music. And that's how we, uh, and the budget for the music for Rocky was 25 grand for everything. The recordist for the tape, if you have to uh, put a harp in a truck and get it crossed down, it's got to come out of that 25 grand. And uh, Bill Conti's fee, everything has to uh, come out of that. So we had one uh, three hour session with a 32 piece orchestra. And when the producers walked into the, into the studio, they said, Bill, how are you going to make any money? But Bill made it, uh, put all of it into that uh, into that score, and and can you imagine Rocky he made the that? money on the top. Uh, <clears throat> well, he yeah, made it. He ten, hung yeah. on to the uh, publishing. Sure. Well, did you think you were going to use classical music for the fight, or or did he surprise uh, you with the with the? No, male? no, no. That's what I wanted. I, 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 long before we began, I I wanted uh, I wanted that. It was because of it, 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 the movie didn't it wasn't written to end the way it did. It was written where the crowd carries out Apollo Creed and then they carry out Rocky. And as Rocky goes by Adrian, he leans over and pulls her up and they go out on the shoulders of the, of the crowd and the happiest night of their life, I think was the last line in right. the script. So we shot it that way. And the crowd carried out Apollo and, uh, and then the AD came to me, Freddie Gallo, and he said, we don't have enough extras to carry out Rocky. Well. Obviously, the same people who carried out the first guy are going to carry out uh, uh, Sylvester. But Sylvester heard this and said, wait a minute, Rocky lost. Maybe he doesn't get carried out. Maybe he just walks down the aisle by himself. There's Spider Rico. Spider says, nice fight, Rocky. There's Adrian. And he takes her hand and they turn and they walk away. And I thought, wow, that's very poetic. Yeah. Let's shoot that. So that's what we did. And if you recall, the poster from the original movie had the boy and the girl walking away from camera. Right. Well, when Bill Connie brought in that last cue, I said, this is great, but I don't have any footage to go with this. I've got these two people going off to a funeral. This thing sounds like those Clairol commercials where the boy and the girl rush across a field of daisies. And I said, why don't we keep uh, why don't we keep Sylvester in the ring? We'll have uh, Adrian fight her way through the crowd. She'll get in there. Uh, I love you, I love you. And we're out and we're listening to this beautiful music. No, 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 no. We don't want to reshoot anything. The word will get on. I said, but look, and I put in the movie, oh, I said, now, instead of seeing this, we see her fighting her way through the crowd. And instead of seeing this, we, we see Rocky going, Adrian, Adrian. I said, how can you beat that? <laughs> So they said half a day, and that's what we did. That's, that's how you got it in half We went day. back there with about 20 people walking in front of the camera, and we, and we shot that. The, the first date 
it was written, they go to a cafe and they sit there for eight or nine pages yakking away. And I said, that is deadly. Let them go bowling, let them go ice skating, but let them move around rather than looking at each other. So we decided, and we had snuck into Philly with a non-union crew because we couldn't afford to go there with an IA crew. And we, uh, uh, we were going to uh, shoot in an ice skating rink downtown Philly, which is like a, a poor man's Rockefeller Center. But the Teamsters caught us uh, after 10 days of shooting, and we had to uh, go back to L.A. And we hadn't shot the first state yet. So uh, they said, okay, well, we've got to put the first date back in a, in a cafe. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe the skating rink is closed and there's nobody there. And we don't have to pay the extras. And uh, Sylvester liked the idea, changed a couple of, of uh, lines, and that's why the place was empty. And it made it so much more romantic and unique. And the guy, eight minutes, you know, and it just made it so much more fun than having two people looking at each other. Sure. Yeah, it, it, it still, again, it strikes me as the part of the reason the film succeeds is because of your independent filmmaker spirit behind it. Would the, fir would the first Rocky have been a theatrical hit today? Um, it's a dark movie. It's not a simple heroic tale. It's a it's a it's a dark. It's and, a and, love story. Yeah, but not a but but not conventional. And, and, well, it's a, and a character study. That's what I thought it was. The, Gone with the Wind is not about the Civil War. Rocky isn't about boxing. It's about this guy and the love affair. I mean, what a sweet love story. But would it have hit today in theaters? Well, that's a good question. Um, uh, it's unlikely it would have gotten financed, but if it did get financed and it did open, and if the studio gave it the promotion that UA did, and they, they did a pretty good job in advertising it, and nobody had heard of it, but they took out a lot of ads, and his life was a million in, of one shot and so on, and a lot of people uh, showed up, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of them was a lot of them were you know uh, younger uh, people who go to the movies today. So I don't know. I don't know if it, if if it. Um... Well, it's always struck me because I was I was about twelve or thirteen this, the, when that movie came out, and people they loved the story, but he became such a. Uh, he became such a sex symbol to especially girls in junior high school. And I feel like the song also, like the combination of those three things, the movie you made, plus his sudden, uh, you know, his, his sudden appearance in the world stage. And then the, it's that, that Conti song is... Uh, oh, listen, without that music, uh, we wouldn't be sitting here. At least I would. <laughs> 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 no, that music was a huge, huge factor in the uh, success of that picture. Do you remember the first time you heard that theme? Um, well, he played all... Wait, hey, let me turn this thing off. Well, he played a lot of stuff on his electric piano, and I played uh, Beethoven uh, for him. And... Dum-dum-da-da-dum-da-da-dum-da-da-dum. Da -da -dum, da -da -dum. I heard for the first time in the backyard where he had a little garage-like studio. And I said, yeah, that's something like that. <laughs> And um, and then when I was uh, cutting the picture, they came in uh, and said, "You got to give us a, a two or three minutes of the movie because uh, we're going to have uh, you know when they bring all the uh, theater owners to like show they, west, show west. Yeah. We we've got to show them the movie so they'll they'll book it and so on. And show them a little piece of it." So I said, okay, and now I went back to my advertising days. And uh, the guy I worked for, a guy named John C. Dow, looked like Fearless Fosdick. And, and he would get all these salesmen together in a, a meeting room at like 7.30 in the morning, and they'd all be uh, hungover and, and so on. He'd, he'd do things like, he said, all right, now, gentlemen, before we begin, I want everybody to stand up and look under your seats. So there are like 60, 70 guys hung over, all stand up, bend over, and underneath everybody's uh, seat was a silver dollar. Hey, Charlie, look at this. Everybody's smiling. Everybody sit down. And, um, and he said, now, gentlemen, that's my story for today. If you want to make a buck, you got to get off your ass. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so he, he, he was a, a terrific inspiration. So I'm, I'm thinking that all these guys who are sitting there in the movie theater have been out drinking all night and it's 7.30 in the morning again and they want to go to, they, they don't even want to be there. So I, I tell the, the guy from the titling place at MGM, I want Rocky from top to bottom on the screen uh, to go over it uh, right to left. And I'll do da dum da da dum da dum And that will wake everybody up. And then we'll show them the two minutes of the, of, of the movie. Well, that intro became so popular that that's how the movie begins. Right. It, it's so interesting to me when, when a piece of music gets put against film oh. that previously hasn't had it and so, sometimes sometimes you can feel it's not right but when it clicks oh you then you got a then you you've you've gotten a gift <laughs> Thus ends part one of my conversation with the late John G. Avildsen. Uh, if you enjoyed it, there is more where that came from, so check it out. Please come back and listen to this podcast. All interview material and audio clips are covered by the Fair Use Copyright Act of 1976, in which allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, education, and research. You can follow me on Twitter at RealRDEF. That's R-E-E-L-R-D-E-F. Please look at my blog. Or don't. But yeah, do it. At least try it once. It's called Movies Till Dawn. You can find it at moviestilldawn.blogspot.com. All kinds of strange, obscure, somewhat haunting, and sometimes frequently decrepit videos about Hollywood and Broadway and classic film and old music can be found there. That is it for this episode of Movies Till Dawn. Uh, I once said to my mother that I had too much homework in school. And my mother said, that's why it's called homework, not home play. <laughs> <laughs>